where on the axis is x equal to 2. Two bumps over. Two oh, no. bumps over to the right as you signal with your hand. Yeah. X is equal to 2 right there. Right? It's the easiest one to see. There are other places where x is equal to 2, right? Uh, is this a place where x is equal to 2? No, no. Here? Here? Yeah. No. X is equal to 2. Oh, but that's not 2, right? Negative. Is it 2 down here? Yes. No. How about here? No. Is x 2 here? No. Oh, well, think about that. Well, well, I thought you would be y2? Well, see, the thing y is, it doesn't say anything about y. It doesn't even matter what y is. All that needs to be true is that x is 2. So if I put a point here, right, directly above this point right here, yeah. if that were a straight dotted line, and yes, x would be 2 there as well. And actually, everywhere along this dotted line, and everywhere below, and everywhere that is. Well, just as Hayden said, two bumps to the right of the y-axis. Anything that is two to the right of the y-axis is x is two. That's where x is two. And if x is equal to three, then we have a vertical line of three, negative four, vertical line of negative four. How about y equals negative <coughs> six? Where is y equal to negative six? That would be down six bumps. Down six here. And anywhere down, that's the six down from the x axis. Yeah. Two. Yeah. is to graph this for, you must have said, x is less than or equal to zero. So what does this mean? x is less than or equal to zero. Right? Remember this is a function, it means that you can plug things into it and get stuff out of it. Input, output, input, output, that's what a function is. So what are we inputting into this function? Or what are we not allowed to put into this function? Any positive number? It's a way to say it, right? Numbers that are less than zero are negative. Zero isn't negative or positive. So the only things that are being excluded are positive numbers. Don't put any positive numbers into this function. That's what this is saying. And so this is, this is the domain. Because remember, the domain is all the inputs. All the inputs. So just telling us what the inputs can be. Normally, if we didn't say anything like this, for a function like this, any x will do. Positive, negative, zero, fractions, decimals, doesn't matter. We can plug anything we wanted for x. The only reason we're not able to plug anything in is because they told us not to. They said, don't plug anything that's positive. Plug in zero or negative numbers. So we can plug in zero. What will I get at for y if I put 0 in for x? We get 3. We get 3. Put in 0 for x. 0 times negative 5 is 0, plus 3 is 3. And there you go. Okay, now, negative 1. Why not? Put in negative 1. So negative 5 times negative 1? 5 plus 3? Positive eight, four, five, six, eight, negative one, positive eight. I know this is a linear function. I know it should make a line. So I have two points. That's all I need. And here we go. Straight line starting from that uh, y-intercept of three. Now the question is, what is the range? The domain is all the inputs, the range is all the outputs. Inputs are x's, outputs are y's, typically. 
So what kind of y values does this function give out? What kind of outputs do we get from this function? What's okay? Negatives. Do we get negative y values from this function? Here, put. Oh wait, no. I need positive y's because the y's are going up. If we look at the graph, we can see that. Yeah. If we look at this, we can see that, right? If this, if the, like, I can plug in as far negative a, an x as I want, right? But I can only go up to as much as zero, right? So that's like the the, the top end of the zeros that I can use. Okay? So that's kind of like a starting point for the y's that I can get, right? I put in that zero, put zero plus three then 3 is kind of like a starting point. All the other values that I get are either going to be bigger than that or smaller than that. That's the way a line works, right? I'm either going to keep adding on to 3 and keep getting bigger and bigger numbers, or I'm going to subtract from 3 and I'm going to get smaller and smaller numbers. We can see by the graph that the y values just keep going up from there. Just keep going up and up and up and up. I can get to y is 4, y is 5, y is 6, y is 7. I can find a graph. The graph exists for all those y values. Could I get y is 300? You know, like theoretically, you don't have to tell me how to do it, but is it possible, do you think? Yeah, you go high enough. Huh? You go high enough. You go high enough? You put in the right value of x, you can get out 300. Can I get 1,000 for y? Yeah. Put it in the right x, sure I can. Right, you get the idea. I can get any y value I want, well, any big y value like that, if I put it in the right x. Can I get out 3? For y. Yeah. What do you put in for x to get 3 for y? Zero. Zero. We already did that. Can I get 2 for y? No. No. No, I can't get 2 for y. Think about it. We're only allowed to put negative numbers in for x. Negative times a negative 5 is always going to be positive. positive. So we're always going to add something to 3. Right? 3 plus something. Always. No matter what we put in for x, because we only put a negative number, we'll always add on something positive. Three. So we're always going to have a number that's bigger than 3, no matter what we put in for x, since x can only be negative and 0. So we'll just go up from there. We can't get 2, we can't get 1, we can't get 0, we can't get negative values. What kind of values for y can we get? Positives, but not positive 1, and not positive 2. 3, positive three. 3 and up. Positive 3 and up, that's how we say positive 3 and up. Greater than or equal to 3. That's what y can be. We can see that from the graph. We can see it from our discussion about the expression itself. Right? We talked about how when I can only plug in a negative number for x, I'm going to get a positive number here. So I'll always get something that's bigger than 3. 3 plus something. Or at the very least, I'll get 3. Um, and 31 is another. Um, like that. So, so again, is the domain. Restricted domain is a domain that we're only allowed to put in these x values. What kind of x values, according to these numbers and symbols, am I allowed to plug in for x? Can I plug in zero? No. No? Why not? Where does x have to be? Between negative one and three. Is zero between negative one and three? Yeah. It is? How about negative 2? No. No, it needs to be bigger than negative 1, and negative 2 is not bigger than negative 1. Can it be 2? Yeah. 1. 2 and a half? Yeah. 3 fourths? Yeah. Negative 0.75? Yes, yeah. yeah, so all of these things are okay. Negative 1 and 3 also, we can plug those in. Okay. So we can get kind of the left and the right side. On the left, I'll go all the way to negative 1. I'll plug in negative 1. Negative 1 times negative 1 is positive 1. Minus 1 is 0. All right, then I'll go all the way over to 3. So 3 
3 times negative 1, that's negative 3, minus 1, negative 4. So we have those two points, negative 1, 0, 3, negative 4. And every other value would be between. Right? So what we have is like the little middle piece of the line. Those represent all the outputs that I would get if I put in things like one half, three fourths, two and a half, two and a quarter, negative 0.3625, all those guys. That shows me all the outputs I would get in that case. So the domain is negative one to three, x can be between negative one and three. What kind of values can y have? I get y is 1. No. Why not? Is it going into the negatives? What do you mean I'm going into the negatives? Uh, you're subtracting from negative x. Oh, well. I, I don't know what I'm thinking. Okay. Wait, no, I mean, you can't. You can't get 1. Because I'd have to put in, well, I'd have to put in negative 4 for x to get 1. Can I put negative 4 in? No. No, I can't get negative 4. Or no, I'd have to put in negative, what am I thinking? I'd have to put in negative 2 to get 1. I can't put negative 2 in because negative 1 is the furthest left x that I can put in. So what is, say, the biggest value of y that I can get? I can't get 1. Can I get a half? How can I tell? Can I tell by looking at this graph? Yeah, you can tell the inputs. That's what a graph is, right? It's the inputs and outputs. We're asking a question about the outputs. Can I get 1? We just asked that. No. no. How do I know I can't get y is 1? Because you have to have negative 4 to get 1. That's true. We said that. And we can't go below negative 1. So negative 4 is out. Okay. Can we get negative 3? If I look at negative 3, y is negative 3, there, the graph exists at negative 3. So there must be some x value that gives me a negative 3 for y. Can I get negative 3 and a half? Yes, the graph exists at negative 3 and a half. Can I get negative 5? No, I go across here and I see no graph. The graph stops existing before that, so we can't get negative 4. So what values of y can I get? One, negative two, negative three, negative three and a half. Yeah. Negative yeah. three and three quarters. Yeah. Negative four point one. Oh. No, anything below negative four point one, I can't get, right? This is this guy's at three comma negative four. So anything more negative than negative four, I can't get. I can't get y to be negative four point one. Negative four and a half. So just like x is between two things, what is y between? What's the smallest it can be? Negative four. Negative four. And it could be negative four, it could be negative three and a half, negative three, negative uh, two and a half, negative two, it could be negative two, because I come over here and the graph exists, right? Negative x is still working, negative one and a half, negative one, yeah, there we go, zero, should give me a negative one. Negative one half, zero, can I get zero for y? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, in fact, we did get zero for y. Can I get one half for y? No. No, because I look at y as one half. I look to the left. I look to the right. There's no graph. There's no line. There's no curve. The, the graph does not exist there. The function has no output right there. Or it, doesn't, it cannot have an output of one half. So what is the biggest that it can be? Okay. Zero. Zero is the biggest that y can get. Can't be anything bigger than that. Zero is the biggest. We can see just by looking at the graph, it's it goes from zero down to negative four, and it stops at zero. Why? Because I know that negative one is the smallest x I can put in. When I put it in, I get zero. That's it. It's, if I wanted to get any bigger than zero, I'd have to put in something that's less than negative one, which I can't do, because the domain has already been stated. So to figure out what the range is, it's helpful to look at the graph the x values.
that we can plug in, plug those in, draw a line between those, and see all of the inputs and outputs that we can possibly find. Right? Remember, this is made up of millions and millions of little points. Now on to 4.3. Section 4.3, we're concentrating on using the intercepts. The reason why we're concentrating on using the intercepts in 4.3 is because a lot of the a lot of the linear functions are given like this, where it's so easy to find the intercepts, right? The intercepts are on the y-axis, we have a y-intercept, we have an x-intercept. Okay. The thing that's, about, that's easy about finding the y-intercept is that's where x is what? What is x along here? So, zero, yeah. It's not over here. It's not over there. It's right in the middle of the positives and the negatives. That's what we call zero. So if I plug in zero for x, then I'll find the y that has an x of zero, meaning the point on the y-axis, the y-intercept. Y is 15. So I have the point zero, 15. If you want to find the point on the x-axis, it's just flipped right now. Y is zero. Y is, we're not up here, we're not down here, we're right on the x-axis. And if you're on the x-axis, then your y is zero. So 3x plus zero equals 15. X equals five. There are the two intercepts, the y-intercept. Draw that line, remember I'm drawing trillions and trillions of points, I'm drawing all of the inputs and outputs that it could possibly exist. And showing you all the outputs for any input between zero and five and for beyond five. Friend wanted you to summarize. Right? They were asking you about what happened in class today, and you learned about how to graph using uh, x and y intercepts. What would you tell them to do? How is it that they would find the y intercept and the x intercept? Variable, yeah, entering zero for the variable x, and then figure out y, and then come over and do it a second time. Put in zero for y, and figure out what x is. Exactly. So let's do that one more time. Let's stop doing that. 23. Can you read 23 to me real quick? Um, it's x minus 4y equals 18. 18? Yeah, 18. 18, okay. Same exact thing. You want to find the point in the y-axis? That's when x is 0, so you plug in 0 for x. So I can zero for x, we'll just wind up with negative 4y equals 18. Uh, combined by negative 4, y equals negative uh, 9 over 2. 0 comma negative 9 over 2. Graph that. And 0, x is 0, we'll go down 9 halves. So that's 2 halves, 4 halves. Halves, eight halves, ten halves, so that'd be negative nine halves. Negative nine halves. Okay. And then we'll plug in zero for y and figure out what point is on the x-axis. X equals eighteen. That would be eighteen. zero for x, we found that y is negative nine halves, 
I get zero for y, find out that x is 18. This is a linear function, so we know that if we were to keep plotting a bunch of points, millions and billions of points, we just wind up making this line. All of the is everything I have down here. Is there any other questions? Then let's pass in our homework and uh, our pink slips. And do this to our desks. find that green Y-intercept, very good. Y-intercept. How did Herschel find the purple point? It's kind of blue on the screen. Yes? Or wait, no, it was on the x-intercept because we're going to say. Uh, okay, this point is called the x-intercept. How do you find it? You can see his work. You what? I'm trying to find it. Oh, four. No, no, what is it? How did you find it? It's the math. <laughs> okay. Is it zero in for y? Yes. Zero in for y. And solve for x. So we should plug in zero for x, solve for y, plug in zero for y, solve for x. Why? Because it's set up so perfectly for doing just that. The way that this is, is written, it makes it very easy to plug in 0 for x. It eliminates that guy there. We're just left with negative 6y equals 12. And likewise, to plug in 0 for y, it leaves 3x equals 12 and solve for x. That's why this is called intercept form, because the intercepts are so easy to find. Questions? So how did Kate know there was a, this should be kind of reddish, a, red, a point at the y, or on the y-axis. Why is it at? It should just say on the y-axis. Or maybe it should say at 2. At 2 on the y-axis. Yes? Because that answer was perfect, it was, I was expecting like a lead up to it, but that's exactly right. If we plug in 0 for x, we get 2 for y. Not, it's in slope-intercept form, and there's a 2, and so the y-intercept is a 2, and you know, I memorized that. But the fact of the matter is, if I plug in 0 for x, then I will get 2 for y. That's just really easy to see in slope-intercept form, because it's already solved for y. I can eliminate this by pl plugging in 0 for x, y is 2 the easiest y to find, right? So plug in 0 for x, and y equals 2. It's just no work needed, no labor. Plug in 0 for x. So how did Kate find the blue point? Yes, plug in 0 for y. Oh, this is the blue point right here. So 
we can't plug in zero for y. It's only that it's not, this, the way this equation is written is not as easy as this one is to do, you know, flip flop. Zero for x and zero for y and then solve for, it's not set up really that way. It's really set up to plug something in for x and then figure out what y is. It's really set up more like a function, like a function normally is. So, how does she find that? Maybe she did. What, what would she have put in? Well, where is this point? Well, it's, where is it? It's at four, you said? Yeah. So what, did, what would she plug in for x in this case? Four. x is four, right? x is four. You plug in four. Yeah. y equals uh, negative 5 fourths times 4 over 1, let's say. Well, 4 is cancel. Negative 5 plus 2 equals negative 3. So we got the point 4, negative 3. What's well, maybe another way that, since this is called slope intercept form, how else can you find that blue point? This is easily identified as our y-intercept because if you plug in zero, we obviously get two, okay? And the slope here tells us every time we move, say, right by four, we move down five. So if I move right four and move down five, there I am at that next point, which is only what we did right here. It's as simple as what we did right here. We started at y is two, y is 2, right, y is 2, and we subtracted 5, subtracted 5. When did that happen? When we plugged in 4 for x, it went over to 4. Or every time we go up 5, we need to go back 4, like one of these things needs to take on that negative, but not both, just one or the other. So if I go up 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then you go back 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, That happens at every, like, if, if I were to plug in one, does it come out nice and like a whole number? If you look at this graph, this graph is pretty decent. If I put in one, I don't quite get out a whole number. The whole number would land right in that dot, right? And it doesn't. What about if I plug in two? Well, not quite. What about if I plug in three? Well, almost, but not quite. When I plug in four, it lands right on the grid, right on one of these dots. Why does that happen? Because we're at four. And what happens when I plug in four? When I plug in four for x and I multiply five fourths by four, fours cancel. Four divides four. Any x value can be plugged into the function, but what x values would be the best? Easiest. Would land us right on a dot. Uh, well, four would. Four would? Um, zero would be. Zero is good. What's another one? Eight. In? Uh, wouldn't like all the factors of four be easy? Well, the word factors isn't right, but I think you got the right idea. Yeah, you know, yeah. Multiples. 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 Yeah, that's what I mean. Every number that has four as a factor. Yes. So if I plug in four, or I plug in eight, or I plug in 12, or I plug in 16, or so on and so on and so on, or negative four, negative eight, negative 12, negative 16, then I get a nice whole number. That's why we use the slope idea, because Every time I plug in a multiple of 4, I can just subtract a 5. If I go over to another multiple of 4, like 8, okay, then I'll just be subtracting another 5, and there I am right there. That'd be 8, negative 8. If I go over to 12, I'll just subtract another 5 from negative 8. And then if I go over another 4, then I'll subtract another 5. If I go over to 4, I'll subtract another 5. Questions about that? Remember, if, if you don't know anything about how this graph is supposed to look, if you didn't remember that this was slope intercept form, that's fine. You're going to probably wind up doing slope intercept form without realizing it anyway, though, because you're going to make the smartest choices for x. Like 0, easy. Okay, 
two for y. And four, or any multiple of four, for x, because we want to cancel out the denominator of four. So if you kind of cut out the middleman and notice the shortcuts, we can just take this to be our y-intercept. Um, two there, move down, down, I mean negative five, and to the right four, down five, right four, or up five, left four, up five, left four. So, multiples of four. Right, let's just work this one out together. And graph. So I sketch the graph for this function with its restricted domain, the given domain, for x's that are, what, what kind of x's can I plug into this function according to this pattern? Um, negative 3 or above. What about negative 3 and a half? Or negative 3 and above? What about negative, yeah, what about uh, negative 3 and a half? Can I do that? Yes. Uh, negative 4 and above. Ah, negative 4 and above. That's what this is. I get it. You're trying to stay, kind of stay away from yeah. negative 4, which is, Good. But we can go even as far as negative 4. So like, I could just put a little dotted line. Dotted lines are usually like not part of the graph. Right? Like they're not included. And just kind of not look at any part of the graph that is to the left of negative 4. Does that make sense? Because I'm not going to use those x values. I'm only going to use these x values. So, maybe we should put negative 4 into the function. Makes sense. We shouldn't we figure out where we're getting started here? So, we'll put in negative 4. y equals 3 fourths times negative 4 times 3. Negative 3 times 3. Negative 6. So, we got negative 4 and negative 6. Input, output. Negative 4. Plug in zero for x. That'd be really easy, right? Plug in zero, we get negative three for y. It's no coincidence. Remember our slope, our rise over run. Three, four, up three over four, up three over four. That's just right there. Okay. I can just keep doing that so I can make sure to draw a really straight line up three and over four. I was looking for. Okay. Does it have to start at three and four? Yes. I mean, that's just, it takes, it takes, I mean, if you wind up with this graph, however you wind up with it doesn't matter. But you do need to like include this part of the graph. So if this is like stopped at the y-axis? If you stop at the y-axis, then you miss this, which is not fully correct. Oh, Gotta include this because x can be as as small as negative four. We need to, our graph needs to reflect that. If we stop at the y-axis and we forget all of this, this would just be for x is greater than or equal to what? Zero. Not negative four. Yeah, we need that. So that'd be like a, I have to say that's a three. A three out of five. If I ever move forward too quickly, then make me go back. It seems like we are all good. Okay. So find the x and y intercepts. An x intercept and a y intercept, these are points, right? They have coordinates. So we find these points, these coordinates of these points that intercept the y and the x-axis. So how do we find these y and x intercepts? Zeros, yeah, we're putting in 
zeros, right? And if we're on the x-axis, then y is zero, and the y-axis, then x is zero. Doesn't matter which one we start at, we just plug in zero there. It's six y equals 18, y equals uh, three. So which one is this, the x or the y-intercept? The y, that's right, it's the y-intercept. The y, the, it's the y-axis at that point right there. Don't need to graph it, just need to know where it is. That's all I ask for. If you did graph it, then that's fine. That's another way to say exactly the same thing. Graph it and it's on the y axis at 3. Uh, if we want to find the x axis, we'll make y 0. So 9x equals 18 gives us that x is 2. 2, 0. Unless there's more questions. Score it out of 20. Can someone describe what the slope of a line is? We talked about it a good bit last time. Can you kind of summarize what the slope of a line is? How is it useful in graphing a line? Just like the increase or decrease of whatever you're graphing. Okay, the increase, the increase of whatever you're graphing. So if I know the slope of a line is 7 eighths, okay, all I know is that the slope, we'll call it m is 7 eighths. I don't, know why. I don't know why it's m. I don't know why it's not s or something. Maybe s was taken to use m for slope. What does that mean? If I, if I have this point, how is the slope useful to me? I would tell you where like all the other points are too. Well, does it tell you where all the points are? Well, yes. no, but it tells you wherever the line is that there is a point there. So there is a point there. Okay, where? Yeah. How do I use the point to get there? Or the slope to get there? Uh, like, let's say you wanted to know if there was like four in the graph. You could go up and then look on the um, four line, and if the line is cutting through that, then there's a point on four. I'm not sure if that gets at what the slope is. Okay. Maybe what a graph is and what inputs and outputs we can expect. Wait, is this the thing where it goes from 7 to 8 down? It can almost. It's up 7, oh, okay. so that's 2, 3, 4, 5, oh, eight. 6, 7, and then go over 8. points everywhere in between, right? But because it's a line, we know it's a straight shot between one point to another, from one point to another. So we can just draw that line, and we found all the other points. Where are all the other points that I'm talking about? Where are all these other points? On that line. On that line. In fact, not only on that line, they are making that line, right? The, the points being plotted so close together, all billion trillions of them so close together, that's what starts to make this line look the way it does. And we can follow that slope forever in both directions. Let's see. What, the slope look like? what if? is 10 fourth, or fourth. And I can go up 10. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, and over 4. The thing that I want you to learn about here as we talk about the slope of 10 fourths is that it's not that this is the next point, right? Not the next point but a point and an easy point to find. Because all the other points are going to be fractions, they're going to be in between two values. This would be the next one that we could expect to be like right on the grid, right at a dot. Well, I could go up 10 over 4, or couldn't I go up 5 over 2? Should that land on the same line? Should. 
You having contact issues? Yeah. You wanna write a pen? You have any? I guess. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so there, there should be a line, right? This line made of trillions and billions of points in between these two points. Not only is up 10 over 4 a way to find another point, up 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and over 2, that's another way to find a point. And anytime we move up and over, and we take the ratio of the rise to the run, we should always come out with this same ratio, or this ratio, or a ratio that's equivalent. So if I go up two, okay, uh, then I would have to come over an amount that is a ratio, comes out into a ratio of five to two. Okay, let's make it easier. Let's go up two and a half, and we'd come over how much? Up two and a half, up rise of two and a half, and a run of one. This is, this is half five, so this would be half two. So the ratio, wh whichever two points I move between on a line, they will always have a ratio of rise over run of the given slope, whatever slope I've got. It's not about the next point, and it's not about the only points, it's not about finding all the points with the slope, but we mark out the slope up and over, rise over run, and then we can draw a line between those. And now we've captured all those points. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Teaching it good? Teaching it well? Oh, sorry. So remember, it's that rise over that vertical over versus horizontal. So let's say that I know that there's a point at negative 2, 1. Another point over here at uh, 11, 8. And what you know is that those two points are on the same line, so we know there's a line that goes between them. Now, we're using the slope or kind of getting an idea of what the slope is. How would I find the slope? How would I find the rise of over run between those two points. Count it? Count it up. Okay. So I start at this one. How high will I have to go? Like what will be the rise between these two points? So we go from one, from a y of one, up to eight. How much is it gonna be? Six. Three, four, five, six, seven. I'm gonna go up seven. Count the run the same way, right? Come over. This is my, this is my x axis. I'll have to go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Of course, I'm a little off because I'm just eyeballing it, right? But if I come from negative 2 over to an x of 11, I'll go 13, right? 13. So, it's not a 3. 7, 13. So that's the slope of this line. Just count it off. What about though if we have x of or a point at negative 43, comma 27. Another point. Hundred and four, comma ninety-eight. You want to count it off? I'm good. Yeah, it's not counted off. But pass. can we <laughs> figure out what that counting off would be pretty easily? Yeah. yeah. How would we do that? Subtract it. Subtract what? The x on the x and the y on the y. The x on the x and the y on the y. That good. Subtract the hundred and four minus negative forty-three. Ah, let's do the uh, let's do the rise. Write the vertical first, and then we'll go down. So how do we do the vertical? 
vertical change from here up to there, up to there. Okay, so let's just kind of draw some, uh, some stuff here. We're looking for the rise of the time, right? So whatever the rise is, whatever that vertical change is, versus whatever this horizontal change is. Well, how far is it from here all the way up to there? Four, three. Or wait, no. 104. No. no. Up. 98. This is the y value. That's the vertical oh, right? Yeah. yeah. 98. How far is it from here to there? 40 or 27. 27. What do I want to know for the rise? I want to know what is this? So we can simply see there's a 98. We take off the 27. We're left with the leftovers. Right? How far it is from 27 to 98. Agreed? Yeah. Okay. So we can just take this y value minus this y value, and it gives us the space in between. And that's what the rise is, is the space between the two y values. So how big is this? Uh, 71? Right? Ouch. Don't I, hope I, I hope I didn't do that wrong. I wouldn't be surprised if I did. Yeah, you're right. Okay. Uh, okay, so I do 98 minus 27. Uh, can I do 104 minus that x right there? Do you think that minus that negative is going to cause a problem? Maybe. Let's see. Minus a negative 43. Okay, so that's 71 up there. And then, well, that's 104 plus 43. Is that what we want to find that horizontal chain? Would it be 104 plus 43? Let's take a look. How far is it from here to there? 104. 104. How far is it from here to there? <laughs> yeah, the size of the distance is 43. So how far is it from here to there? 43 plus, or 104 plus 43 more. 47. So it even works, like this idea of just subtracting one value from another value, even if one of them is negative, because if you subtract a negative, you wind up getting a, you know, an adding anyway. That's, that's what we want. So 71 over 147. I think we can't simplify that a lot. I think 71 is a prime number. Correct me if I'm wrong. No, I'll do it. You won't correct me if I'm wrong? No, I don't mean I'll type it in. Uh, so, anytime we have two points and we want to find the slope between the two points, you think this trick will work? Subtract the y's, subtract the x's, we'll find the distance between them? Mm -hmm. I bet we will. That will work every time. So, if I have this point and this point, it doesn't even matter where they are, you don't even need to draw axes. There's just two points. Whatever their coordinates are, so this is point one, this is point two. Well, where, where is point one? Is it negative two, seven? Is it five, forty-six? We don't know. We do know what it is, it's represented by some x and y. Speaking in general. Point two also, is that some x and y? But that would get confusing. That's x and y and this is x and y? So we give them slightly different names. We, we change it up a little bit. This is point one, so this is x one. And this is y one. This is point two, so this is x two. And this is y two. Going back here to the specific example, we took the y value, 98, 98, minus 27, and it gave us that rise, that vertical change. 
what would that look like here? It's not 98 minus 27, it's y2 minus y1, okay, the y of 0.2 minus the y of 0.1. And to find that horizontal change, for the y's we take the, this guy minus this guy, this y value minus this y value. And for the x's we'll take this x value minus this x value, x2 minus x1. Remember that our slope is a rise over a run. We go up and then we go over. The numerator is the vertical and the denominator is the horizontal. So if the numerator is vertical, rise, then it must involve the vertical part of the coordinates, the y values. Yeah? So rise is the numerator, run is the denominator using the horizontal parts of those points, those coordinates, the x values. So I'll give you a couple of points. Try it out yourself, see if you're catching on. probably went the other way, so I'll go with this way just to show you that it worked out the same. All right, so this is point two, so the x2 and y2 come from here, this is point one, so the x1 and y1 come from here. We have seven minus, remember that if you're subtracting a negative two, make sure you show that. Don't make the mistake of minus two when it's minus negative two. So that's y2 minus y1, x2 minus x1. Get negative seven plus two is negative five. Negative three minus five is negative eight. What's a negative divided by a negative? A positive, so this is a positive by the yes. So I got two over negative nine, so what does that do wrong? What you do wrong? I subtracted, like I subtracted the y's and the x's. slope, it's a fraction that tells us that between any two points, the ratio of vertical, horizontal, will always be 5 to 8 for this particular line, 5 to 8. This might be 10, and this might be 16, but the ratio is still 5 to 8. This might be 
two and a half, what would this be? Four, be four. Still a ratio of five to eight. Whatever the rise over the run, whatever the vertical change over the horizontal change, that's a ratio always of five to eight for this line. Not for every line, but for this line. If we look at the points, negative three, negative seven. There's a point, uh, five, negative two. One, two, three, four, five. Right, that's the vertical from here to there is five. And over one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So even when things are negative and all that kind of stuff, as long as we make sure that when we subtract the negative, we're adding, you don't get something like uh, you know, negative seven minus two. It's not seven, negative seven minus two, it's negative seven minus negative two. Or if we go the other way, negative two, let me show you how it, it, it doesn't matter. Negative two minus negative seven. 2 minus negative 7, as long as, if I use this one first for the y's, I need to use this one first for the x's. 5 minus negative 3. Negative 2 plus 7 is 5. Negative 5 plus 3 is 8. So, still get 5 over 8. We just didn't have the negative over negative first. It was just positive. That's how they came out. And remember, it's rise, that's vertical change. Which thing is vertical, x or y? Y, y, so this would be change in y, change in the y's. What's the difference between this y and that y? Well, that would be how far it is from one to the other. Anytime we want to know how much something has changed, we'll always do subtraction. If I had $10 yesterday and $1,000 today, and I want to know how much did my money change, I'll just take today's minus yesterday's. That's how much my money changed. Same with y, same with x. It's rise over run. We got the uh, change here in x. Change in y over the change in x. We'll take, it doesn't matter which order we do it, whether we start here and this is our other point, or we can start with this one and go that way. So we do 5 minus 12, that's the y value, so that's the change in the y from one point to the other. 5 minus 12 now, negative 3 minus 5. So negative 7 over negative 8. Negative, five, negative is positive, so positive. If you did it the other way, 12 minus 5 over negative 5 minus 3, uh, or 12 minus 5 over 5 plus 3, 5 minus negative 3, and you also got 7 over 8. Yeah, So how is it subtraction? Since like positive 12, positive 5 is positive 17, when, when did it change? When did it change? Yeah. Change. Let me let me plot these two points so I can show you what I mean by the change. Um, here's negative three, five, and five, twelve. So five, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So remember, we're looking for the pattern of vertical to horizontal rise over run between two points. So how do I find that distance, right? That'd be my rise. Well, to find that, this point is at negative 3, 5. And this point is at 5, 12. So this distance is 5. This distance is how much? 7. No, from here to there. Oh, 12. 
12, right? So how, is it, how far is it from here to here? 12 minus 5, right? 12 minus 5 leaves us with this 7. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. And then when we look for this distance, the idea of subtraction still works because we have this, this uh, distance of 5, right? From there to there is 5. From here to here is 3, or three, whatever. The, the, how far away we are from the y-axis is 3 away. So how far is it from there to there? If we take 5 minus negative 3, we wind up doing 5 plus 3, giving 8. So this distance is 8. This one's 7. This is the run, the run is 8. Did I answer your question? Yeah. I'm not sure if I answered your question. Yeah, I don't. positive slope, then like, one line of the positive slope will look in, like will have something in common with every other line of the positive slope. It'll kind of act the same way. How will they all look similar to each other? And they both have positive slopes, so they're all positive slopes. Yeah? They'll both have positive numbers. They're positive numbers, I guess. It's going up. So that's the thing. It's going up. It's going up like this. But because if it's a positive slope, it's going to be a, a positive number over a positive number. So if I start at some point, then I'll go rise is positive, run is positive. I will go up and to the right. As I go from left to right, I'll go up. Right? So a positive slope goes like this. Or even if, say, say I find this point, even if it's negative over negative, so it's still, it's a still a positive slope. I can go down and to the left. Down is negative, left is negative, down to the left still, positive slope. Tyler? Um, so on rise over run, is x on the bottom or is y? Y. Okay. Oh wait, did you say the bottom? Yeah. X is on the bottom. So okay. okay. X is on the bottom. Okay. What, oh, wait, 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 wait. What about a negative slope? What kind of slantiness will a negative slope give a line yeah. down from left to right. What about a slope of zero? Straight. Straight. Like this. And an undefined slope? Vertical? Vertical. Oh, I think it's a good 